Today, I'm going to do two lectures today, and both are about figures who criticise Locke and Locke's way of looking at the mind. And if we take Locke as the early instigator of cognitive psychology, these are two figures who really laid the basis for the criticisms which can be made of much current psychology. So the debate between, it wasn't a debate, the criticisms of Locke's successors, I think are very important for understanding the criticisms which can be made of cognitive psychology or the cognitive approach today. <coughs> and so in the first of these lectures, part one, I'm talking about one particular critic of Locke, the third Earl of Shaftesbury, who I will admit is a particular favourite of mine. And if you look in most histories of psychology, you won't find a dicky bird about the third Earl of Shaftesbury, which I think is a grievous error. And I shall be outlining the life of Shaftesbury, particularly his personal link with Locke. We've already come across the name Shaftesbury. The devious politician and great survivor of the Civil War, who became a major figure uh, uh, in both the parliamentarians and later on in the monarchists, and who hired Locke. But there's a further link. And I shall be talking about the third Earl of Shaftesbury, who had a very different view of a person, a different view of a world than Locke. And in his view of a person, he emphasizes something which Locke misses out. The possible role of instinct. What we're in, what's born into us. What is innate in us. The very things Locke denied. And this leads to some big questions. How to be, how to be scientific when studying people, the person, what's the scientific approach we should take <coughs> to studying the mind? And then the more important question, or a preliminary question, should we actually be trying to be scientific? Or is this image <coughs> of science getting in the way of us from understanding us <coughs> as human beings? Quite a shocking thought for psychologists who take the assumption that to be scientific is the way to understand people. But Shaftesbury said, well, if science is doing the sort of thing Locke does, maybe being scientific stops us from understanding the very things we should be understanding. Okay. That's menu for part one. Let's start off and revise what I've said about <coughs> science and thinking of the mind. But both Locke and Hobbes were great believers in science and trying to think scientifically, cutting away all the prejudices of previous ages, all the ass assumptions coming from common sense, to ask, how do we really think? What is the mind like? And if you're going to be scientific about the mind, and if thinking about the mind scientifically really got a big upheaval, a big impetus in the 17th century, you've got to ask the question, what does it mean to think scientifically then? Not necessarily <coughs> now, but then. And this was a day, a time of the new physics, the newest... Uh, Astrology, astronomy, astrology, astronomy, sorry, oh, too early, and the new chemistry and new anatomy. 
certainly in the new physics and the new chemistry, and the new anatomy, being scientific often meant you took big things, big physical objects, and you tried to break them down into their component parts. And with the aid of mi microscopes, and microscopes were really just being developed at that time. The new science depended on this new technology for grinding lenses and constructing uh, uh, microscopes. With, with, with this new, these new implements, you could see things which previously you couldn't have seen. So you could say that tables, what's composed of tables, you could see more of the little elements which comprise tables. And Harvey could see the corpuscles in the blood, which previously blood was just thought to be a consistent, a sticky red consistency. And in physics, above all, you had the hypothesis that all matter was comprised ultimately, including our bodies, of atoms. And does anyone know what the word atom really meant? <coughs> Why the physicists took the word atom to describe the composition of matter? Does anyone know what atom means? It really means cannot be divided. It's the, the basic unit of the world. You can't get any smaller, thought the physicists in those days, than atoms. You can divide a desk into two parts. You can divide those parts into two and those parts into two. And if you keep doing that, ultimately you get down to something smaller and smaller and smaller, something you can't even see, and that will be an atom. And atoms became for many scientists, then and later, and even today, a philosophy of science. That science means that you take complicated objects and you try to reduce them or discover what are their basic elements. What are their atoms, as it were. But going smaller means being scientific. The scientists search for the basic units of matter. That's one way of being scientific, certainly in the 18th century, uh, 17th century. And then if you say, well, let's be scientific for studying <coughs> the mind. Let's apply the same principles as we do to matter, to tables, to things. to the human mind. And if being scientific is reducing things to their basic elements, <coughs> how do we reduce the mind to its basic <coughs> elements? Well, we have to be on the lookout for what we could term metaphorically psychological atoms, the very things in which the mind is comprised, the very basic things. And in a sense, not that Locke used the term atomism. Don't, 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 don't say Locke described his approach as uh, being atomist. He didn't. But in effect, he was doing this. He was looking for the psychological atoms of the human mind. And where did he find them? In perception, but in what he called clear and simple perceptions the very basis of <coughs> seeing something out there in the world clearly and simply. What, what, what he did is he took complicated beliefs. I believe it's going to rain tomorrow. I believe uh, that uh, you are the same person I saw yesterday or whatever. He took these basic beliefs and try to see how they were formed in the human mind, what the basic elements of 
basic origins of these beliefs were. And he took apart complex beliefs in order to show their origins in simple, clear, and what he assumed to be true perceptions of the outside world. And he said, what we do to form these complicated ideas is we reflect on our simple ones and put simple ones together, associate this idea with this idea, and therefore we build up our knowledge from the simple things, from our, if you want to say, our psychological atoms. And he assumes that the mind is empty until it receives <coughs> Perceptions, <coughs> perceptions of the outside world, and then the mind is set into motion, combining things, and sometimes combining them wrongly. And psychological atavism, we could say, is the desire to discover the basic elements of the individual mind. But we take the belief we know we have complex views of the world which we have, we break them down into smaller and smaller elements to see where they've come from and what are the components of the mind. We could say that, in essence, is just what Locke did or tried to do. And that's why he thought in some sense, he was being, uh, being scientific. There was another <coughs> aspect of 17th century science. Oh, oh, sorry. Which was actually searching for laws of motion. This is really important for Newton. Newton's physics was based on how, not just what what were the atoms underlying things, but how things moved, how planets moved, how if you dropped an apple, it fell straight to the ground and didn't wander about or shoot upwards. And motion, of course, was a key concept for Hobbes' theory of perception and why he was using the language of science when he talked about motion. An object out there having a motion to the eye and then motion from the eye to the brain and motion from the brain to the heart and from the heart to the legs to move forward if you like the person you see or move backward if you don't like the person you see and how to be scientific in this way was to discover the laws of motion and then reduce complex actions to simple motions. Oh, the person likes, they move towards. The person doesn't like, oh, they move again, away. Taking something complicated and reducing it to simple motions. And Hobbes' view of a mind was, <coughs> in this sense, a simplification. <coughs> Physical motions <coughs> following perception and simple reactions. And whichever perspective you take, whether it's Hobbes' view of a mind or Locke's view of a mind, there is an assumption that you can understand the mind. And this assumption underlies much current psychology. You can understand the mind or the brain by looking at what goes on in an individual. To understand the mind, you take one individual and you examine how they perceive the world and what they do when they perceive the world. And this was the methodology of much later psychology. Much of later. You study individual reactions, or you study individual perceptions. You explore the mind and try and break down the complex operations into the mind into as simple ones as you can.
It seems reasonable. But there's a limitation. <coughs> You're not looking for power systems. You're dropping everything down into the mind of the individual. And then you've broken down that complicated mind <coughs> of the individual to the few processes in which you're interested. And what it means is you've cut that individual off from, if you want, the wider systems <coughs> of life in which that individual lives. And you could say there's another way of being scientific or studying humans is to see what function these atoms, these small things, have within the wider system, including the individual mind. What function does the individual mind, the individual person, have in the wider system in which the individual lives? And therefore, you could say, you don't just need theories about little things. You need theories about how systems operate. And here we have a dilemma for psychology. You could say that you know, this is what Galileo did. Uh, looked at the system, didn't just say, well, what does the Earth do? It's the Earth in relation to the Moon, the Earth in relation to the Sun, in relation to other planets. <coughs> <coughs> Basically, the model which both Locke and Hobbes instituted was a limited model. The role for Locke, the role of, a perception, uh, of perception in the cognitive system, if you want, in our cognitions. The role of the role of emotion in an individual's belief. And the limitation, a key limitation, is both assume that you can understand the mind by looking at the individual in isolation. <coughs> How to study psychology, take a person and look at them. And later psychologists would say, take a person, put them in a laboratory, take them out of ordinary life, put them in the laboratory, put them under the psychologist's microscope, and you'll see things you couldn't see otherwise. And that is based on the assumption that you can get to the secrets of psychology by looking at the individual as an enclosed system. Just as you can't understand the Earth and what it's doing without understanding its relations to the other planets, to the Sun and the Moon, so you can't understand the individual because the individual belongs to wider systems. The individual doesn't exist as a unit. It has social relations. It lives within a society. And societies live within other systems. This raises a, a question which is still very much alive in psychology. This is not a historical question. This is a question for modern psychologists, particularly modern social psychologists. Can traditional science, can the scientific method, can the method of atomism understand society? Or do we need a different approach? A social scientific approach, which has different assumptions to understand social relations and society. And this means that the study of the mind should not be a study which takes the individual <coughs> as its unit of analysis. And critical psychologists have said that said, no, you can't use the model of the individual even to understand the individual. But they reject the scientific model as the correct model for studying psychology. Do you get the point I'm making? Does anyone want me to go over it again? No? Good.
Now, the third Earl of Shaftesbury, 1671 to 1713, not a long life, and a major <coughs> critic of both Locke and Hobbes. And his great book was called The Characteristics of Men, Manners, Opinions, Time. Actually, he spelt characteristics with a K, but I've cut it down. I think it looks better with a K, a CK. And it's a difficult book. I don't think I've recommended that you read it, and certainly don't start at the beginning and just plough your way through. But, uh, it contains, it's like a potpourri of different things. It contains a variety of different writing styles. It doesn't just have formal academic essays like like Locke's uh, uh, um, uh, 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 writing. It has imitation dialogues. It has uh, essays which uh, he, uh, uh, Shaftesbury write as if they're letters to friends. It does have some essays. And the third volume actually is written as if it's written by someone else, criticising all the, the previous two volumes as, uh, as Shaftesbury criticises his own work and institutes a dialogue with his own work. And above all, it's not trying to be scientific. Shaftesbury, unlike Locke and unlike Hobbes, did not venerate the new science. He actually had the assumption that atomism fails to understand people and fails to ask the key questions. And I think his work contains similarities with modern, postmodern critical psychology. But you shouldn't look at the individual in isolation. That's the wrong tactic to understand the individual. But human nature is to be social. Not like Hobbes said, uh, we actually just want to look after ourselves and get our own, look after our own interests. And that uh, unless we had order, we'd all be just so selfish that everything would fall apart. And that if we want to understand what we should do, how people think, how they should behave, you need to understand the social system. You need to understand the place of individuals within society. And there's a place of societies together. And above all, Shaftesbury recognised the importance of language and social interaction. The importance of language, he was a great believer in the aesthetics of language. That you should try and write as beautifully and clearly as possible. And that's why he had all these different genres of writing in his book. He, he treated uh, writing as literature. And certainly he thought that language was something social. It's what brings us together and not trying to base the human mind just on perception or on emotional reactions, as Locke and Hobbes had done, but to see us as the, the communicating animal, and that means being a social animal. was hired by the first Earl of Shaftesbury to be his political advisor. And the Shaftesbury I'm talking about was the grandson of this man. The grandson of the first Earl of Shaftesbury, that rather devious politician. Now, I have a dilemma at this stage. Maybe you can help me out of the dilemma. I know that all of you are very serious and like to know about the history of ideas. 
and you want the serious stuff. I like the gossip as well. And there is gossip to be told about the relations between Locke, the first Earl of Shaftesbury, the second, and the third Earl of Shaftesbury. Can I beg your indulgence for a moment and give you some gossip? Will you, will you allow me to? I know you don't want it. Uh, it's a, it's a, yeah. <coughs> I shall say something about the lot, the role of lot in Shaftesbury's, the third Earl of Shaftesbury's life. But we, to understand that role, you have to go back to the first. The first Earl of Shaftesbury was not born an aristocrat. He was born in a higher social status than Locke, uh, but he wasn't an earl. His surname was Cooper. Uh, he was landed gentry, quite well off, but not, not as well off as he'd like to be. His life, and it's a life which took him from being quite well off to being one of the most powerful and feared figures in the land and then to exile, narrowly escaping uh, and being hanged and flayed, as I said. <coughs> uh, his life, I think, has a, bears a moral for you all. Look, I, I, I'm talking about the history of ideas, but at this stage I can give you a moral lesson about if you want to succeed in life. I would say look at the life of the first Earl of Shaftesbury. How did he get on? How did he rise? Well, from cleverness, from uh, other deviousness. But there was something also he did, and which you all, sh all should think about. It's, it's, I wish I'd come across his life when I was young, because I didn't follow what he did, which is marry above yourself. Married to someone who's wealthy than you. And don't do it just once, do it several times. He <laughs> married three times and each time it was uh, to someone richer than himself. So he went up a stage and then he went up a stage and then when he went up a stage. He did, uh, in fairness to him, he didn't divorce his wife, so uh, they died. And I was so sad. <laughs> so bear this in mind when you choose your future partners. This is probably the most valuable thing which I'll ever <laughs> teach you. <laughs> now, he ended up in the aristocracy. In those days there weren't life peers. If you were made an earl as he was, it meant your children would bear the title, uh, at least if they were male. And Shaftesbury as he had become, despite his free marriages, he was not over endowed with male heirs. In fact, he only had one, one son. A great uh, disappointment in his life, and the, great, the greater disappointment was the nature of the son. There was something odd about him. We don't quite know what. But it seems like he was odd both physically and mentally. One poet who was an enemy of the Shaftesbury's, who wrote a poem about the Shaftesbury's, just described his son as the blob. Now, if the family name, if the, sorry, if the earldom was to be transferred and continue after Shaftesbury's death, which he wanted more than anything, it was necessary, not just that the blob lived, but the blob would marry and the blob would have his own sons of blob. Oh, how would he ever find a wife for the blob? And being a snob and applying his principle, he wanted the blob to marry above himself, to marry not just an aristocrat, but into an old established aristocratic family. See, Shaftesbury wasn't an old family, he'd just become an aristocrat. He was new, new rich or new aristocracy. How could he get the blob to, to marry into an old aristocratic family? Well, if you had a dilemma like this, which 
I'm sure nobody will have, and I certainly never had. But if you have a dilemma like this, how do you find the right daughter for your son? Delicate to ask. Oh, and do not imagine that arranged marriages are just a product of Eastern culture. They were very much established in Western culture, especially the higher up the society you went. So he entrusted this delicate and important task to his most trusted advisor, John Locke, who he knew not only was of supreme intelligence, but great tact and sensitivity. Again, there's a connection with the East Midlands. <coughs> Locke looked at the lists of aristocratic families and decided that actually it was the aristocrats who lived in the Vale of Beaver in Beaver Castle. It's not the present Beaver Castle, which is rebuilt in the 1900. In the old Beaver Castle, that they had a, a lot of daughters and uh, they might be susceptible to being persuaded to marry into the Shaftesbury's so long as they never met the Glock first. And Locke negotiated, and yes, yes, uh, the younger daughter of uh, uh, surname with manners agreed. And, uh, uh, Shaftesbury asked Locke the question, does she look healthy? Do you think she'll breed and breed quickly because she'll get tired of the blob very quickly so he's got to get her pregnant pretty early on. And Locke said, yes, 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 yes. And Locke was a big genius. Not only could write big books, but he was right on this. And so the marriage took place. The blob got his new bride pregnant almost immediately. And Locke was instigated to look after, because he was a, a doctor, or almost a doctor, he'd almost passed his exams, look after uh, 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 the Blob's wife, see her through the pregnancy, superintend the delivery, and then with the grandson, uh, um, the first girl asked Locke to superintend the education of the young grandson who will become the third Earl. And Locke did, he kept in touch with the, the third Earl, he saw through his education, he hired tutors for him, he talked with him, and the third Earl, in later life, would refer to Locke as his foster father. He didn't think much of his real father. Oh, and I should add, the real, Locke would be right, the real father's uh, wife, uh, from the East Midlands, did soon leave him and get fed up with him and went and lived on the own. But the Earl of Shaftesbury had secured the line of succession, which still continues today. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the last but one Earl of Shaftesbury was actually involved in a dreadful scandal in the south of France with the... <coughs> oh, no, you can find out for yourself, but it involved, it involved murder, prostitutes. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Well, as you would imagine, and as Locke would imagine, uh, if you control the environment and what a child is taught, you control their minds. Because the mind is empty at birth, and the ideas just come in. And so you could bring a child up with a love of learning, as Locke would want, and above all, a love of philosophy. And he succeeded. The third Earl of Shaftesbury wasn't a man of action like his grandfather, wasn't a blobby failure like his father, but was a philosopher deeply interested in questions of philosophy. But there are limits to what you can teach a young child. What was his philosophy? It was a total rejection of Locke's philosophy. Absolutely total rejection. Not of his politics. 
the third Earl and Locke were both suspicious of kings, suspicious of, suspicious of, of Catholics. They both supported the Whigs against the Tories. The Tories then uh, were the forerunner of a modern Conservative Party. The Whigs were the forerunner of the Liberal Party, which became uh, the, uh, the Liberal Democrats. And in Shaftesbury's philosophy, he didn't look to the modern scientists. He looked to the classical writers, <coughs> the writers Locke had rejected to the ancient Greeks, to the works of Plato and above all, the figure of Socrates, wandering around the marketplaces of Athens, talking, discussing things, querying accepted opinions. It seems from the letters between <coughs> Locke and Shaftesbury that only once did they have a write about philosophy and then they realised this fundamental gap and because they cared for each other, they loved each other. The, 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 the old man with the young boy he'd, he'd raised, his mother he had selected. And Shaftesbury, he loved his foster father, what he called his foster father, who respected Locke. And so they wrote about other things. And the third Earl didn't begin publishing his thoughts until after Locke had died. Now I'll summarise some of his views. But he was against, he opposed the philosophy of atomism, especially when applied to trying to study the human mind. And against a belief or a trust in scientific truth, he, he thought atomism, when it was applied to human beings, led to triviality. If you say about ideas, well, where did this, this complicated idea come from? Let's <coughs> unpick it and see its simple origins. Well, he just gets smaller and smaller. And that's what he thought Locke was doing. He, he, Locke's view, views of a person was getting smaller and smaller. He said, what matters? How my ideas are compounded, how they're put together. <coughs> or why bother with philosophical speculations about the formation of ideas, their compositions, comparisons, agreement and disagreement. Why bother with this would be the very basis of Locke's <coughs> essay concerning human understanding. No wonder he waited until the beloved Locke had died. He was saying, all this is trivial. It doesn't matter how you put together ideas. What matters are the nature of the ideas. Are they right? How should our I what sort of ideas should we have? How should we judge the world? And above all, what are the ideas which would enable us to live in a moral and just way? It doesn't matter where they come from. And he was sceptical that this atomistic way would find a clear and simple scientific truth. What if there wasn't just one view? As if you do all this and you find the true theory and then all the problems of life are solved. So no, nah, you won't have it like that. Look at the ancients, look at Socrates uh, throughout his life arguing about what is the good way, never finding it, but uh, unsettling other people's certainties. So we, we must learn how to judge people not seek certainty. The search for certainty was wrong, just misplaced, missed the real point of thinking. And in this, he took what we now call the holistic approach. Again, not quite at the term he would use. 
the importance of the whole, the wider system. Judge nature, judge humans, as parts of a wider whole. <coughs> In general, said we cannot give the least account of a particular part without a competent knowledge of a whole. So you can't really understand the individual mind if all you do is look at that individual's mind. You must understand the individual as a part of a wider whole, the bigger system. For instance, he, and he did use the term system, but each creature is part of a larger system. You can't understand the spider without understanding the fly. You can't understand the fly without understanding the tree and the mammals and so on. Male and female, take the individual. Well, is that individual male or female? Well, you can't understand the male without the female or the female without the male because each forms the species part of a larger system system of that species. And for human species, which include both male and female, young and old, part of a wider system, part of a world, a universe, with other species. You can't understand a human unless you understand what they eat, where they live. And what we eat depends on other systems. And this is in the days before factory farming, of course. And the species linked to the system of the Earth, and the Earth to the wider galaxies. And so, if we start <coughs> wanting to understand humans and human ideas, don't just ask, how did I get to my ideas? Ask, do they help link me? to the wider system in which I live. We shouldn't view humans in isolation, but view them as connected to each other and to nature. This tactic of just taking the individual mind, but seeing how stimuli uh, get into that individual mind was going to miss out the important aspects of being human. And then, it, 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 there is no part of Shaftesbury's work where you say, ah, and now he deals with Locke. He just he floats in and floats out. But Locke traced back the origins of ideas to the child with an empty mind and said, this is the start of it all. Shaftesbury said, no, no, it cannot be the start of it. And he criticised Locke's ideas of the idea that the mind is born without, without any innate ideas. Because Shaftesbury <coughs> said the, in, the infant's mind is not empty and that we do have innate predispositions. We are predetermined by our nature as human beings to think in particular ways. For instance, he said that we have a moral sense, uh, uh, let's start with a, an aesthetic sense, that there are certain patterns which humans find more beautiful than other patterns. Later, Gestalt psychology would take this up. And he said, we have a moral sense. The one thing which you can take from by looking at societies across the world, is all societies have a sense of morality. The sense of morality may not be the same, what one group called good, another group might call bad behaviour. But all society, no, societies have a morality, a sense of what there are things you should do, things you shouldn't do. So, Shaftesbury argued that humans have an innate moral sense. Not saying all, I mean, but uh, the majority of us do. And then he makes a very, very important <coughs> point. He said, saying this <coughs> does not mean, as Locke assumed, that the young child must be 
have a, have a show of moral sense. The baby clearly doesn't show a moral sense. But it's possible to have innate predispositions which reveal themselves as you grow older. And the moral sense is one such thing. Not that he would have published this in an outward book, because he was a very uh, old-fashioned person in some ways. But in a letter, a private letter he wrote to a young student who he was sponsoring at Oxford and who he wrote about Locke's philosophy, he gave the, the analogy of the sexual instinct. He said, if Locke were correct, there would be no innate predisposition for procreating the species. And if Locke were right, it all would depend on being taught it by your parents or by reading about it in a book. And, he's, and he said, well, that wouldn't work particularly efficiently and some societies would just peter out. But it doesn't seem to happen. And that even though babies are not born wanting to fornicate with other babies, but it takes a while for this innate predisposition to be formed, but then does guide our, our actions. <coughs> a very important argument, I think, for saying that when we talk about what is innate, it doesn't mean the baby has to show that behaviour or that thought. And then, oh, I'm running a bit late. Shaftesbury showed the brief and argued for the evolution <coughs> in both rock and rock about the social nature of humans. And Shaftesbury said, at one point, and again it's hidden amongst lots of other things, there is a big difference between the human species and all other species. For the human infant is helpless for a long period of time, much longer than any other species. Some species, as soon as they're born, the creature can go shuffling off look after itself, some it may be a few months. But humans, none of us could have survived unless there had been adults who looked after us. And so Shaftesbury said, there must be amongst humans some sort of predisposition to care. It's a predisposition to be in helpless and there must be a predisposition to care. And why is the human infant so helpless for so long? And he said, this helplessness ensures that we form social bonds with others. We rely on others. And for the species to exist, these others, these mature people, must be predisposed to look after helpless infants. And this helplessness, then, this attachment to those on whose, whose actions we, we depend, that we couldn't survive without their help, lays the basis for later social attachments the attachment of an initial carer, whether it's nurse or mother or father. Attachment such as to the family, to your own locality, you called it, the village, of a nation. But as we grow older, instead of just being attached to those around us who fed us and nurtured us, we become attached to wider groups. And that we are social creatures, above all, influenced by others and by language. And here is where Shaftesbury introduces the, the notion of common sense. And he uses it deliberately in, in different ways. He's not like Locke saying, you must define a term. Each word must have one meaning. He reacted against Locke and said, the best way to use language is to create resonance like pulse. 
common sense. But one of the meanings of common sense, which Shaftesbury said, is sense of community. So the Latin sensus communitas. Common sense is sense of community. And we, we do have a sense of community because we've been born helpless. We develop the bonds, we imagine ourselves belonging with others. <coughs> and he said that human beings have this common sense and it's only denied by philosophers and that isn't common sense. So then he slips into the other meaning of common sense as good sense. And so here is a rejection of Hobbes but it's human nature to be selfish. And Shaftesbury saying, well, look, if it's human nature to be social, the individual doesn't exist in isolation, it exists in terms of a wider system, whether it's family, village, nation. <coughs> and then there's a moral presupposition. If this is our nature, then it is our duty to be social, to care for others, to think not does this gain me an advantage, but does it help others? And this was very much part of philosophy, uh, Shaftesbury's philosophy of service to others. And of course, it's based on the rejection of lots, but all knowledge comes from perception. Because uh, this social thing is in built and doesn't come from without. But also the infant is taught by parents and teachers, so knowledge is also itself social, is shared. And how do teachers and parents teach their infants? They talk to them, they discuss them. Knowledge is based on language, and for Shaftesbury, language is social. I should be rushing through this so that we finish in time. Locke had said, well, what is thinking? And for him, it, well, it's a perception, and then it's a reflection on perception. But in the individual mind. But Shaftesbury has, as it were, a social image perception, uh, of, uh, sorry, of thinking. Thinking is what happens between people. You talk, and it's great. Image was of Socrates wandering around the marketplaces of Greece, talking with other young men, and discussing things with them, and discussing the uh, problems of the day, not coming to conclusions, but there was always more to discuss thinking in practice. And in one of the essays of the characteristics, there's uh, advice to an author how to write better. And this soon resolves how to think better. Your writing will be better if you thought through what you want to write in the first place. <coughs> how you think, not like Locke said, we'll try and match up each idea to a perception. No. Shaftesbury said, mentally divide yourselves. Divide yourselves in your mind into, a, into two camps and have a debate with yourself. Have an argument with yourself. And there's a very different view of thinking. To think better is to argue, either with other people or with yourself. But it's through the activity of discussion and relating to people that we will think better. Not sitting in isolation and trying to match our thoughts to perceptions. And this image of thinking, that is through the use of language and language in communication and in interaction with others that we engage in thinking, is very like some movements in critical and discursive psychology today. And if that is right, then I should stop talking.
five minutes. And I've got, I forgot to hand round the uh, uh, regis register first. Thanks. You can sign it and pass it along. Okay. <laughs> And in part two, episode two, I'm talking about Thomas Reed, another great critic of Locke and Locke's way of doing things, and uh, a very great Scottish philosopher. We're, we're going to move from England to Scotland in this lecture. I've already mentioned... Shaftesbury and the idea of common sense, well, Reed took this notion further. And he was a major critic of Locke and Locke's philosophy of ideas. Locke's work, but it was called the way of ideas. And in many respects, Thomas Reed's arguments about Locke and about his concept of ideas are very similar to critiques made by discursive and critical psychologists today against cognitive psychologists. And it's one feature of modern psychology <coughs> that modern psychologists every few years announce the discovery of the wheel or the discovery of an idea <coughs> which, if you have a sense of history, you know has been voiced before. And read raise this enduring question, which is still troubling psychology. Do mental entities, like ideas, like cognitions, do they exist? Or are they just an abstraction which gets in our way of understanding? OK, this is what's happening in episode two. Reed's life is quite an uneventful life in my respect. He trained as a pastor, a churchman, a Protestant churchman, and he lived in the very far north of Scotland, north of Aberdeen. I've never been there. Not many English people have been there, and certainly not in those days. And he lived a quiet life. It was quite a nice life as a pastor, as a, pre, uh, as a vicar in, in a small community. It wasn't a particularly demanding job. He had to give his sermons on a Sunday and he had to visit parishioners. But there was a lot of time for reading. It seems like Reed had a predilection for thinking in terms of ideas and concepts. And some of his uh, community found his Sunday sermons rather dry and rather boring. They would have preferred hellfire and brimstone, you know, you sinners, repent! <coughs> Reed seemed to say, well, what does it mean to be good? And so on. Well, so it would have stayed and Reed would have not been there, <coughs> a quiet, pleasant, traditional life of a Scottish priest, uh, a vicar, I should say. But in 1739, when Reed was in his, in his late twenties, David Hume's Treatise on Human Nature book I shall say a few words about, a fellow Scotsman David Hume was, was published. And Reed read it and was absolutely shocked. Because here seemed to be a philosopher arguing for atheism and using Locke's philosophy to do so. 
and Reed thought something has gone wrong. Unlike, uh, and Reed was a very devout man. He thought this must be refuted. Not he didn't say this must be opposed. We must ban it. He said I must find out the error. And if I don't find out the error, I must change my views. So he took to finding an academic post to leave his, <coughs> his quiet pastoral life. Joined King's College, Aberdeen. And he spent many years trying to work out on his own while still, uh, still working as a, as, a, as a pastor. And then he joined the academic world, became professor of Glasgow University, and in the same year he became professor of Glasgow University, his book, Inquiring, Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense, was published, and it was an attempt to refute Hume. To show where the error was with you. And in showing where the error was with you, it was to show where the error was with Locke. Now, Hume was just the person the bishops who criticised Locke predicted would rise up. They said to, to Locke, I said, your philosophy, even though you are a religious person, your philosophy is going to encourage scepticism and atheism. Hume was both a philosophical and religious skeptic. His philosophy was shown why there are no firm truths, and particularly why there's no firm truths on that religion. Hume, unusually for his time, was actually an atheist. And even on his deathbed, he didn't repent. And Hume based his whole philosophy on Locke's analysis of the mind, but drew out the sceptical implications which Locke had shied away from, which rather uh, worried Locke. If knowledge, if our knowledge of the world comes from perception and is subjective, <coughs> then we can never be absolutely certain that the world we see is actually the world as it really is. All we experience are our own ideas of the world. We don't experience the world directly. We just have our own perceptions of the world. And there are no real grounds for believing in God. There's no perception of God. And so we cannot have knowledge of God. This is just something people assume. He also said, we can't actually see causes and effects. We see, I can switch on the lights again or switch them off. You can see me doing that. But you can't actually see a cause becoming an effect. And above all, we can't see good and bad. We see what is, but we can't actually perceive what ought to be the case. So these what we think of as good and bad are just our own subjective preferences. They're not objective qualities, similar to Hobbes. And this <coughs> was shocking in the 18th century. Hume caused the furore. By accounts, he was a very nice man, somewhat overweight, but very nice. No, I shouldn't say it like that. <laughs> he wanted a university post. He applied for several in Scotland. But of course, no way. Not a fit person to teach young minds. And he went down south, lived in England, and earned his living not as a philosopher or as an academic, but writing popular history. 
which sold well, and he enjoyed writing, and he was a very good writer. Now, the problem with, with for Reed was, as a young man, he'd read and studied for the university, and he'd accepted <coughs> Locke's analysis of the mind. It seemed quite reasonable. Yes, how do we get our ideas of the world through perception and we reflect on perception? And it, but he now saw with the publication of, of Hume, there's a problem. This would lead to religious and moral scepticism, lead to philosophical scepticism. And then, after that, he thought it was his life's work to find the error in Hume's and Locke's reasoning. Because if he couldn't find the error, if he couldn't locate that there's something wrong in this way of looking at the mind, then his faith would be threatened. Because this way of looking in the mind seemed to justify scepticism. And in his inquiry, he thought he'd found was proposed as a refutation of Locke's way of ideas, concept of ideas, looking at the ideas, and it, which formed actually the basis of Hume's approach. And in its stead, he proposed a philosophy of common sense. You can see a link, because I've already said in, in episode one, but Shaftesbury pointed to the importance of uh, common sense. But Reed did not acknowledge his debt to Shaftesbury. And he probably was quite wise in doing so, because Shaftesbury was suspected of being an atheist or an agnostic. He certainly was suspected, and I think with good reason, for not being a Christian. Again, very dangerous, very uh, scandalous in those days. Because Shaftesbury had looked his great the figures he, he greatly admired were the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, who, none of whom those he admired were Christians. They believed in Zeus and Jupiter and Mars and whatever. And there is some evidence that uh, uh, Shaftesbury was not a Christian in his deep down beliefs. Not that he could say this. There's a story about, well, it's more than a story, it's, it's true, but when Reed had finished his manuscript for the inquiry, he sent a copy to Hume. Now, Hume had already heard that this uh, pastor in the north of Scotland was rather <coughs> against him, was going to publish a big book against his work. And Hume said, words to the effect, why can't the priests stop bothering philosophers? Why can't they just keep keep to their real job, which is bothering God. And he, Hume clearly expected this to be a religious rant, saying, oh, you are immoral, and so on, and so on, and so on. But when he read Reed's book, he was absolutely delighted, and wrote back a letter, which I think shows the great public-spirited nature of Hume, congratulating Reed and saying he hadn't read anything so intelligent and so entertaining for a long time. And this was a work which was trying to refute his. And Reed wrote back again friendly to Hume. It shows the sceptic and the religious man, the, the believer in one philosophy and the believer of the counter-philosophy, can respect each other. They can beg to differ, but differ humanely and civilly. I think it, the story reflects well on both. Well, why read, read today? Because Reed's criticism of Locke's way of ideas is very similar in some respects. It contains some of the basic ideas of discursive psychology's criticism of cognitive psychology. 
You'll, you'll hear more about this because I, I, I shouldn't think you've yet had. Have you had any lectures or practicals on discursive psychology yet? No, this will probably come in semester two because you are actually in a place where discursive psychology is very, very strong. <coughs> uh, in fact, most of the members of the social psychology group, in some way, I've just put a few names there, most of them have been major contributors to the development of discursive psychology. And you can't expect us not to indoctrinate you with our ideas later on. And basically, the discursive psychologists, and we're not just here in Loughborough, we spread throughout the world. Oh, we have grandiose plans. No. It's based on an idea that uh, if you want to understand how people think, how they interact, you should use qualitative methods rather than experiments. And also, you should look to see how people actually and naturally use language. That language, conversation, what we do with language, how we speak with each other, how we engage in conversation, shapes thinking. <coughs> in some ways, this is very similar to the point which I left off about Shaftesbury and the importance of dialogue. <coughs> Do you want me to explain something further? Is it you get is it getting too complicated? No, no. Uh, just like anyone, stop me if it is. Now, discursive psychology has two further assumptions, both of which you can find in the eighteenth century in Rick. Psychological words, and I mean words which seem to refer to psychological phenomena, like I think, I believe all need public criteria. They're public words. We need to have generally accepted rules about how we use them. That although these words, like I think, seem to refer to an inner state, when I say I think, I'm referring to my inner thoughts, which you can't see to beliefs and attitudes, but we can't use them in this way. I believe, I remember not referring actually to inner states. And you say, I believe it's going to refer to, uh, it's going to rain tomorrow. You're not saying, I believe it's going to rain tomorrow because I've looked into my mental representations and I've come up with a thought which is rain tomorrow. You're not quite doing that. And when we do that we, that when we speak, we do things with words. And if we want to understand what it means to say, I believe it's going to rain tomorrow, we think we've got to look and see where the person said <coughs> what, what they were doing with their words. And normally, if you look closely, these statements, I believe it's going to rain tomorrow, are very complicated actions, uh, social actions. Saying, I believe it's going to rain tomorrow means, let's not, depending on the conversation, could be, let's not meet outside in the street tomorrow. Um, it, it all depends on the context, what we're saying. And discursive psychologists take these two concepts very seriously. You'll hear more about them uh, later on in your, your, your course. And they often trace them to a 20th century philosopher, Wittgenstein, who I think I did mention in the first year. But there's an old heritage than Wittgenstein. There's Thomas Reed in the 18th century, who had, in some ways, rather similar arguments to Wittgenstein. And it's Reed who I'm talking about. But I mention this to say these <coughs> ideas do connect to, to later ideas.
discursive psychology has two further implications. This is going back to modern psychology, going back to modern, moving forward to modern psychology. One is, and you'll learn this, to avoid assuming the existence of inner mental entities, cognition, representation, schemas, all these terms which are so crucial for modern cognitive psychology, discursive psychology, to say, well, there's no proof that they actually exist. And psychologists infer their existence on the basis of outward actions, including outward actions, especially outward actions of talk. I believe it's going to remain. Rain tomorrow, I'm reporting my inner state. And that psychologists, if I want to understand thinking, if I want to understand how people live in the world, should study how people actually use language, what they do with language in conversation, and not spend their time hypothesizing unreal entities on the basis of artificial experiments. And at root, there's an argument here in discursive <coughs> psychology which parallels Reed's arguments against Locke. <coughs> so there's a parallel between di what discursive psychologists say about cognitive psychology and this assumption of the existence of mental entities such as representation, schemata, and so on. Parallel between that and what, oh, in the mid 18th century, Reed said against Locke's concept of ideas and against Hume. The difference, the big difference, is Reed thought that it was his moral duty to speak in this way. That the, the error of Locke at root was a moral error, an important which was leading to scepticism, leading to atheism. Later discursive psychology's arguments against cognitive psychology, and I include myself in it, has no real moral purpose. It's just saying, aren't we clever? We are cleverer than you. Now, where was the <coughs> basic error in Locke and in Hume. What was going wrong with Locke's analysis of the mind? Well, we've heard Shaftesbury saying, well, it wasn't taking into account innate previous dispositions. Reed has a very good argument, a very clever one. starts by saying that Locke's philosophy, this way of ideas, is based on an assumption which contradicts common sense. I'll say what the assumption is. But Locke, uh, sorry, Reed says that if philosophers, and he would include any student of the mind, so what we call psychologists now, contradict common sense, then we're faced with a dilemma. Should we go with philosophy or we should go with, or should we go with common sense? And Rita, always go with common sense unless there is a reason not to. Unless those who are attacking common sense can show why their philosophy is better than But if it's just a matter of, oh, there's an alternative, you can go with common sense, or there's an alternative philosophy, Reed says, well, you might as well stick to common sense. So then he said, he went out and in what way does Locke go against common sense? And Reed is meaning common sense here. <coughs> ordinary people believe, and that it may be good sense. And what is it about Locke which contradicts common sense? 
It's this concept of ideas. That we only have ideas or impressions of the world and that we don't experience the world directly. But Locke had said, look, if I look out at you, I just have the impression of your faces. If you look at me, you all have an impression of me or an idea of me. You don't actually see me. You see your idea of me, your impression of me. The, the, the mind takes impressions from the senses, and therefore we only see our impressions. And impressions are is being to of things or people. We don't see the objects, we just see our impressions, our ideas of the objects. And modern psychology is similar to this. We have our representations of objects, and we see representations of objects. We have cognitions of objects. And the way of ideas, box view, shared by Hume <coughs> and other philosophers, is that the mind is composed of ideas. And Reed said, this is against common sense. This isn't what the ordinary person says. my hand. Do you see my hand? Is any of you going to say, no, I don't see your hand. All I see is my, my impression of your hand. No, it's common sense to say we see things. We see tables, we see people, we see hands and whatever. We see the world. Locke claimed to be scientific. Basing his analysis on real things, but, says Reed, have you noticed? The central concept in his analysis of the mind is itself unreal. And it's not based on perception. What is an idea or an impression? Have you ever seen an idea? If knowledge is based on perception, and Locke has put this notion of ideas right at the centre of his theory of knowledge. It is something which cannot be seen. Look, here's an idea. Oh, no, where's it going? I can't see it. I can't see an idea. I can't see an impression. <coughs> and Reed said there's no physical evidence for the existence of ideas, and certainly not in the brain. What is the brain composer? Go and cut open a brain and do all the ideas leap out and say, ah, oh, there's where they've been lurking. They've been lurking in the brain. No, says Reed. Cut open the brain and all you see is soft, moist, medullary substance. I love that phrase. And so he concludes that talking about impressions as the object of perception. We see impressions. Is either a phrase without any distinct meaning or is grounded in a hypothesis which is destitute of proof. And a similar argument could be made today against the reality of cognitions. But cognitive psychologists say our minds work on cognitions. Have you ever seen a cognition? Cut out the brain of the cognitions come pouring out, or the mental representations of the schemata. There's no direct proof of their existence. And if they did exist, what sort of things are they? But they are treated as if they are real by cognitive psychologists. So in this sense, we could say that Reed is an early anti-cognitive saying that the mental entities, which those who analyse the, the mind propose as being true entities, they're things which we have no evidence that they exist. 
the lock is saying, I base my theory of perception, uh, theory of knowledge on perception, and there he talks about things, the existence of things, ideas, which we cannot actually see. I have never seen an idea, says Reed. Are you with that argument? Was anyone... Ah, it's wonderful. And Reed, rather like Shaftesbury, used the term common sense with multiple meanings. Common sense is good sense. Common sense for sense of ordinary people. Common sense for sense of community. Common sense for sense of things which is common to all <coughs> humans. And above all, that's how he used it. And it's common sense to believe that we see things, we see the world, not that we see ideas. And humans have a common, I share, sense, which is common to all humans whose minds work properly. And this common sense ensures that when we perceive, when we get information from our ears, our eyes, our, our noses, our touch, that we know the difference between a sensation which arises from within us and a sensation from outside of the world. That when we perceive, for instance, look at another person, we don't imagine that person is inside us, inside our brains. We assume as we perceive the world that the world exists beyond our minds. And this, he said, is part of human nature. This is the way we're made. And actually, Reed, in his book, The Inquiry, has a detailed, chapter after chapter, detailed examination of our senses. And most interestingly, unlike Locke, he doesn't depend on the visual sense. In fact, he starts with smell, the sense of smell, smelling a rose. <coughs> you don't imagine the roses in your nose, just smelling a rose, even with your eyes closed. You imagine there's an object out there giving you that sensation of smell. And that our sen sensations are not pure and simple, they're based in an idea that the world exists outside of ourselves, and that is part of perception. And also, Reed said, but humans have common, common senses, shared senses, that we're social beings. Humans made for living in society. Here, 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 this is the <coughs> idea from Shaftesbury, a sense of community. Not the isolated brain. Using the same side. I thought not. I thought not. I've missed out things I didn't want to miss out. Oh, I've taken the wrong lecture. Has anyone printed off the uh, slides? I do. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I was aware of this. Um, it's like it. Something says in there. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I 
I think most is the same, but the one thing which I realise I've missed out, you'll want this. It's okay. No, 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 it's all right. Uh, is, tell me, prompt me when I get things wrong. Is about J.J. Gibson and his ecological theory of perception. Um, okay. And how modern <coughs> Reed's theory of perception is. <coughs> because Gibson, one of the great, in the 20th century, great psychologists, uh, stuff, oh, if this happens again, please put up your hands and say, you, you, you've got the wrong lecture. It can happen. It, can, it does happen. Oh, I'm so annoyed with myself. That Gibson proposed an ecological view of perception. That is rather holistic. That people perceive the world, they are quite active in perceiving. And part of his theory of um, direct perception is that perception is not based on mental entities. Like Reed, Gibson said, we perceive objects. When I assert that perception of the environment is direct, I mean that it is not me mediated by retinal pictures, neural pictures, or mental pictures. Right, this is rather like Reed saying about Locke's way of ideas. We actually see things. We don't just see our pictures of things, our mental pictures of things. But Gibson takes the point even further. And there is some evidence that Gibson had read Reed, because in one of his books he, he quite <coughs> read Reed. It's quite interesting. That Gibson, above all, says that R Locke was absolutely wrong in thinking that perception is a passive process. Remember Locke said we just open our eyes and in floods the world and we don't have to do anything. Gibson said that if you look at how people actually perceive the world, they're constant, we're constantly seeking out information. Look at the eye movement. When we perceive objects, our eyes aren't keeping still. They're moving. It was called circadian movements. They flash about. Why? Because if you want to see an object, you want to see its edges, you want to understand how it exists in the environment, which means how it exists in space. So you don't just want an image of it from one point of view. You constantly want to see the different angles. You move your head, you move your eyes. We're not aware that we're moving our eyes all the time. And Gibson said, traditional perceptual psychology has got it wrong. Trad traditional perceptual psychology imagines that we build up our image of 3D objects from two dimensions and that we make assumptions that this, this object must have a back and so on. But that would only be true if we're absolutely passive, if we're not always seeking out information, walking around object, touching, touching, getting as many different views of objects, sensations of objects as we can in order to understand the world and interpret the world in which we live. And this means that perception is a deeply active process. And it's based on the fact that we assume the world exists without us, as Reed had said, and we experience it directly. We don't just experience pictures of the world. And we try to see what moves and what is invariant. We do this by combining <coughs> all sorts of information. 
all sorts of images. From touch, from hearing, from our senses and so on. And the implication which Gibson took from this is very important for psychology. <clears throat> because his ecological view of perception, and I'm so sorry I haven't brought a slide with me, is that we should examine how people naturally perceive objects. Look at what they do. How we exist in our natural environment. How our eyes are always moving. How we tilt our heads to see things. How we touch things and so on. And Gibson, who was a great expert on the psychology of perception, said the more you try to involve controlled experimentation, the more you misunderstand the natural process of perception. Because he said that perceptual psychologists tend to have, have tended to think that the scientific way is to examine perception in an experiment and to control perception. So you get people heads in a head clamp, they can't move, and you put them in darkness, and you flash a light, and they say, can you see that light? Yes, and is that light brighter than that light? Yes, 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 yes. And you build up a knowledge of how people perceive lights flashed or whatever, in just the way they don't, but we don't perceive when we actually exist in the real world. Our heads aren't clamped. We move them. Why do we move them? But if we want to understand the perceptual process, we should examine what we do when we're in our own ecology, when we're perceiving the world. A huge statement now. But being scientific may actually be being unscientific or missing the phenomena which you're aiming to study. And this is very, very similar to the arguments which discursive psychologists make against the psychology of language. They say, look and see how people actually use language in conversation. Don't set up experiments where people are given nonsense words and see if they remember this nonsense word better than that nonsense word. That isn't language. That isn't what we do. In the same way as Gibson says, these strange perceptual experiments don't tell us how we actually perceive the world. And interestingly, Gibson, when he makes his theory about what it is to perceive the world, says just the same as Reed said all those years earlier. Don't think we perceive pictures of the world. We perceive the world. We do things to perceive. It's an active process. And actually, Reed <coughs> Reed applied a similar argument to language. You see, it's very easy, the, the Lockean perspective, which many cognitive psychologists have said, is that language is just used based on... If, you, you have these mental representations of things, and then you learn to attach a, lang a label to your mental representations. So you learn that this mental representation is this, this is white, and this is grey, whatever. And that each word stands for a mental representation. Reed said, 
and discursive psychologists say, language doesn't work like this. We're not all the time using language to report our inner states. We use language as part of life. As Shaftesbury said, we use language to think. So, if you hear someone say, I believe that it's going to rain tomorrow, I think that it's going to rain tomorrow, or this afternoon, do not imagine that such a statement stands as a report for an inner idea or inner experience. That we directly use language to do things. And uh, Reed said, one of the things we do with statements like, I think, in my opinion, or in my view, is we're being modest. We're not claiming absolute certainty. We're, we're showing respect sometimes for the other person's view. I think it's going to rain tomorrow. What do you think? Oh, no, no, well, maybe it will be quite fine. So you use, I think not as a report of a mental essence, but as a way of interacting with someone. And this idea, this idea can be found ooh, 250 years ago in Breed. And therefore, the argument between Reed and Locke, an argument which Reed takes from, from uh, Shaftesbury, is still relevant, I think, today. Because it comes down not to how to defeat <coughs> scepticism, how to preserve religion, but what should psychologists be studying? Should we be seeking to study the inner mental processes which by their nature are unobserved? You can't see a mental representation. You can't see a memory store. You can't see how the mind takes the present sensation and compares it to the memory store? Or should we be studying what we do when we see, as Gibson said, look and see how the eyes are moving about, what the person's doing when they're exploring their environment? And should we study this, these matters, by designing artificial experiments or, or by trying to observe what we actually do in our daily lives. Reed's analysis of the perceptions, if you go and read them in their very detail, is really trying to account for how we go about the business of smelling something or touching something and using our sight and our ears and so on, and how deaf people or blind people might build up a similar view of the mind, of the world. Or do we need controlled experiments to do this? Shaftesbury said, do not expect all the problems of the world to be resolved as if some things are certain and some things are absolutely untrue. Sometimes you have to weigh up the arguments. And on this matter, where do we get our evidence for how the mind works is a question like this. It's something for you to make up your minds about. Whether experiments are useful or the only scientific way of studying the mind, or whether observation in the real life can provide us with the key information. Don't expect, as Shaftesbury would, a clear yes or no. Look at the balance of arguments. Test the arguments. How do you test the arguments? He said, debate. Enter the debates. Read about the debates and then form your own views. Divide your own minds into thinking the pros and cons. And I must finish again.
then with an apology for having forgotten that I've revived this lecture and coming up with an old one which wasn't as good as the one I didn't give. I'm sorry.